Welcome back to Google Headquarters. I'm Lewis Gray. I'm here with Krista Seiden. Hey guys. To talk about Measure Matters. This is episode two, and today we are focused on measurement for growth. Uh, we're happy to do this directly from Mountain View in the studio where Google Analytics is being built right now as we speak. And so real quick, I wanna talk about our agenda. Uh, this is our second episode of Measure Matters. We welcome back all the viewers who we had last time, and especially wanna welcome those of you who are seeing this for the first time, whether you're watching it live or on the recording. We wanna make sure you're on top of those things. We wanna have a quick look at the industry. One thing I observe a lot is that our partners and our customers really go to bat for us and have a good conversation about what it is we're doing with the suite. So I wanna highlight some of those today. We're gonna to go through the big question, and the big question, like I measured up front, is measurement for growth. Uh, we're gonna talk about that and have us understand how as marketers, we can use data to make smart decisions. We're gonna have Krista go deep into that. And then obviously Q&A. If you have a question that you want answered live today, just tweet to us using hashtag measure matters or jump in the YouTube live stream and ask a question right there. We will get to it. So real quickly, what is measure matters? This is our second episode. And as I mentioned, in case you missed the first one, I wanna do a fast recap. In the first episode, we talked about machines. You know, we talk a lot at Google about machines and machine learning and what they, they can do. And we wanna talk about whether they're coming for our jobs. You know, we hear a lot of things about development and people who are concerned about advents in technology. You know, are the machines going to do what we've taken for granted for a long time? And so we tried to answer that in episode one. We hope you go back and check it out. We talked about how that's changing the entire measurement industry. Krista and I had this kind of deep introspection of whether they're gonna come for our jobs. And you might just have a robot here in a couple of weeks. Maybe it's not that fast. <laughs> Hopefully not. We talked about a conversion probability uh, that was introduced last week. Uh, sorry, not last week, but in the last month or so. And basically taking a look at how often it is that you expect a visitor to your site to make a conversion and expect that to go through. We talked about a very popular launch of Google Analytics data set for BigQuery. And talk about machines. They're breaking down huge chunks of data. And we talked about that. And then the last piece, I wanna highlight Analytics Academy 360. Krista did a ton of work on that. Uh, so if you're used to seeing her up on your screen at YouTube, uh, that's probably where she came from. So real quick, we're gonna dive into what's happened within the Google Analytics product suite in the last few weeks since we talked to you. Uh, Krista, why don't you take it away and talk about advanced analysis? Awesome. So one of the things that we just announced this past week is the beta of advanced analysis in Google Analytics 360. So this is a new way of deep diving into your data and really doing analysis that wasn't possible before in the analytics user interface or through custom reporting. You could have done some of this through uh, BigQuery, of course, before and really get very deep there. But we're bringing a lot of this to you in a friendly UI now. Uh, there's a couple of different techniques that have launched. So there is a table report. So basically this is a big explorer table where you can drag and drop dimensions and metrics and segments and really slice and dice and break down that data in a table format, however you want. There's also a segment overlap. So you can actually apply up to three segments and see how these different segments of users overlap based on different metrics or breakdowns that you wanna analyze. And then if you find a really interesting segment, you can actually save this segment and use it later in analysis or for audience sharing. And finally, there's a new funnel report. Now, this one is particularly near and dear to my heart. I actually helped to build this one. Uh, and what's so great about it is that it takes custom funnels from GA360 and makes them so much better. So you can now have up to 10 steps in these funnels. You can segment up to four times, comparing up to four different segments. You can break it down by different uh, metrics and dimensions. So really it's very, very powerful. And we are super excited about this launch. I know I personally am very excited about this launch. So if you're a GA360 customer, I highly encourage you to go ahead, click analyze uh, or the analysis tab from the uh, GA user interface or from a custom report and go check out uh, advanced analysis in GA360. Yeah, I was super excited to see this launch. You know, anytime we have the word advanced, you kind of just go, ooh, <laughs> go check it out. <laughs> right. And we've already seen a lot of uptick with people talking about it and, and trying new things that they mm -hmm. weren't able to do within GA360 before. Yep. And so real quick, I want to talk about uh, Data Studio Community Connector Code Lab. Now, that's a lot of words. But, you know, Data Studio is our visualization product. We want to be able to take the data that you're looking at and break it out of those tables that you've been looking at for a long time. We want to have it smart in a visual way. And one thing I really like about Data Studio is it's not just Google that it taps into. We want to be able to pull in any content that makes sense for your business to measure and have it displayed well. 
And so what we introduced at the beginning of this month, it was a brand new code lab, which is a step-by-step -step tutorial for you to build your own community connectors. So if you're somebody who's working with an app or working with a new service and you wanna bring that conversation into Data Studio, you wanna have it appear directly alongside all of your Google data, your Facebook data, your Twitter data, whatever you're pulling through, and we wanna have you be able to go ahead and cook that up. And so what they let you do is really have an end-to-end -end visualization solution that's user-friendly and delivers high value. So if you're somebody who's been trying to get content into Data Studio, definitely check out this tutorial and you can get started right away. Yeah, I think that's super exciting because it really opens up even more ways of getting more data into Data Studio and visualizing everything together for your business in a single place. And, and what I like about this type of a role is we're not just talking to end users who wanna understand how many people came to their website. Mm -hmm. We're talking to developers who are building really cool tools with APIs and JavaScript and really making new products so that we can be talking about them the next week when they finally launch. Yep. So, uh, Lewis, why don't you tell us what is the new word on the street or what are people talking about on social media in the past weeks? Uh, absolutely. And as I've mentioned before, one of the best things of my job is being able to hear directly from you. I get to see people react to Google Analytics, find out when things are broken, find out when things are launching. And one of the best things that happened in the last couple of weeks since you and I were on the air is Google I.O. You know, Google I.O. is our big developer conference. We have it annually. Uh, this year it was held up at Shoreline in Mountain View, not too far from where we are today. And one of the things that caught my eye was something called guess.js. And so what guess.js does is it taps into what we were saying a couple weeks ago about machine learning, and it tries to predict the user behavior. Now, where this comes important is with web performance. If you're a website developer and you wanna make sure that your users are happy with the loading of your website quickly, especially on mobile, one of the tools that they use is something called prefetching. And what prefetching does is they anticipate what links the user might click on, including all those images, and they load them in the background while you're reading the current page. Yep. So with guess.js, which is a collection of libraries and tools, they can guess which links you're gonna click on and only download those instead of downloading every single one. This sounds like a small piece, but if you can increase the loading of your page by say milliseconds, the conversion rate is dramatically higher. And we see this all the time, especially as you've seen this transition from desktop to mobile, getting that speed right, getting that performance right can be critical in terms of how your application performs. And this is real interesting to us. It leverages the Google Analytics reporting API. Uh, Adios Mani, who presented at Google I.O., talked to us about it. We're very excited to see this launch. So if you have a chance, literally you can pause the video, take down that URL, copy it in your browser, and then keep going. And let's do that. Uh, Conversion XL. Uh, Conversion XL is one of the great uh, pieces I read regularly talking about measurement. And specifically, they had a piece on running marketing experiments. We talked a lot about Optimize. I know this is one of Krista's favorite products, uh, talking about always be testing. Uh, and as someone who's always looking to find just a little bit of an edge to see what kind of performance you get in a message, in a, a UI, any type of different thing, they took a look at it and said, well, what kind of hypotheses are you running on your experiments? Because people often get that message, you must experiment, but they don't think further. You know, what are those key performance indicators that make sense for your business? How do you decide them upfront? What kind of metrics do you need to make sure you're doing it the right way? And what is a leading or a lagging indicator? I thought this was a very good post from Conversion XL, and they're able to take it even beyond just web and email to understand how your campaigns are performing. So definitely check this out. If you're getting your feet wet in optimization, if you're a marketing person who wants to get just a little bit more out of each campaign and understand what copy works, I definitely take a look at this. They showed the control groups, variation group, mm -hmm. and obviously you want to pick the one that performs the best. Yeah, I'm going to double down on that point you made about making sure that you choose your metrics beforehand. Uh, one of the things that we often talk about in optimization is knowing what those key metrics are and making sure that you've settled on them as a business beforehand so that you're not making the test fit the results, but you're actually analyzing the results based on what you set out as your goal. And that's super important. You know, I give conversations all the time. I was speaking at Haas Business School at Berkeley where you and I went mm -hmm. uh, not too long ago. And we had that debate around optimization. And what often happens is people do that measurement halfway through. You know, they start it and they say, okay, what are we measuring? <laughs> you need to know that up front. You need to have, and we're going to talk about this, your North Star, we'll talk about this in a bit, mm -hmm. about what really drives your business. And you need to tr track down from that. What are the metrics that will get you there? And so we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, one thing we're also going to talk a lot about in the next episode of Measure Matters is Firebase. But right now I'll give you a little preview. We talked about IO 2018. They introduced MLKit, which is Machine Learning Kit, which is a new software development kit for Firebase 
that brings machine learning to your iOS or your Android apps. And they also came out with brand new improvements in performance monitoring and brand new reports with improved analytics called StreamView and DebugView. So if you are an app developer who wants to get good analytics using Firebase, definitely check out their updates from iOS 18 if you missed it. Yep, for sure. And I can't wait to dive deeper in the next episode. Absolutely. So that brings us to our big question. Now, Krista, you go all around the country, sometimes all over the world, to be honest, talking about measurement for growth. And we have a very interesting role here at Analytics where we want to help marketers succeed with everything that they do. So I'm real excited to kick this off and, and hand it to you and have us talk about measurement for growth. Yeah, you know, growth is one of those terms, growth hacking, growth marketing, that has really exploded in the last five, six, seven years uh, in the market. If you've been in the digital or marketing space uh, during that time, you will have heard this term. Um, and I think there's, you know, there's a debate amongst the analytics folks and, and measurement and uh, marketing people as to what is growth marketing or growth hacking? How is that different than what we all do every day? Um, and so one of the big things that I've been tackling this year and that we're gonna tackle right now in this episode is what is growth and how do we measure for it? So with that, let's go ahead and dive right in. So I wanted to first just set the, the stage with a couple of definitions. So growth hacking is a process of rapid experimentation across marketing channels and product development to identify the most efficient ways to grow a business. Growth hackers are marketers, engineers, and product managers that specifically focus on building and engaging the user base of a business. So there's a lot of buzzwords that we hear when it comes to growth. So we hear growth and analytics, SEO, testing, engineering, experimentation, all of these different buzzwords. Uh, and when you look at it, when you look at them all together, uh, especially in this little graphic, it kind of seems like a growth marketer is Wonder Woman. Uh, but let's break it down. So uh, over the past couple years, I've been uh, asking a few friends in the growth space, what is the difference between a growth hacker and a digital marketer? And over and over again, I keep hearing very similar things. So I hear often about this funnel of marketing. And at the top, we have acquisition and activation, basically getting people to your site, getting them to sign up. And what I hear the growth folks saying is that that is a digital marketer. Digital marketing is responsible for those top two pieces of this funnel. And then we have retention and revenue and referral and the bottom part of that funnel. And when you look at the funnel holistically, that is what a growth hacker does. So I have a few reactions here. First of all, that's the last time I'm going to say growth hacking in this presentation. I personally hate that term. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we're going to continue on with growth marketing or growth. And second of all, throughout my career uh, in the analytics and optimization space, I have built and led teams for analytics and optimization. I've been a digital marketer through and through, and I've done every single one of these things, every single part of this funnel in that role. So I personally don't really buy that there's this huge distinction in terms of these pieces of this funnel from a digital marketer to a growth marketer. But as I've looked into this further and further, I do think that there are a couple of things that set growth marketing apart. And they're more mindset, they're more how a team is organized and how um, the, the actual goal of what you're doing is set out, but not necessarily in terms of these role definitions here. And so one thing I, this really highlights my own career because both of us have done each of these things. Mm -hmm. One of my very first roles was as an e-marketing manager. Mm -hmm. And that's a very specific role. You know, we very much talked about online campaigns, net newsletters that are going out, uh, optimization of your website. And even, I was kind of like the webmaster, but they yep. wanted to give it a cool title. But I'm sure you did all of these things. Absolutely. And all these things, it looks very, very familiar. You know, this <laughs> comes from filling up that funnel when you look at your customer relationship management tool. Mm -hmm. When you look at the KPIs of your business, as a marketer, pretty much revenue is that tippy top one. I used to have a boss sure. who used to say there's two types of people in this company. You're either in engineering or you're in sales. <laughs> and so even if you're called a marketing person, you're in sales because if you're not driving revenue, what are we doing here? Totally. And so every single piece of that digital marketing uh, grid, every single piece of growth marketing has to be driving toward that North Star, which we're going to get to. Yep. So a few things that do set growth apart that I've come across. Um, the first is this idea of product market fit. So this is the idea that you have to have a good product in a good market where these two things go together. You can have a great product, but not be in the right market and you don't have product market fit and that product's not going to survive. So a great example of this, uh, I think, is 
Uber in China. So uh, a couple years ago, I think it was August of 2016, Uber actually announced that they were pulling out of China and uh, folding their China business into their competitor Didi. Now, I actually happened to be in Shanghai the week that this happened, and I had been heavily reliant on Uber up until that point, uh, and then all of a sudden I couldn't use it. I also couldn't use Didi because I operated in Mandarin and you needed a Chinese credit card. So as a user uh, who is used to using Uber everywhere, it was unfortunate for me, but it didn't work in the Chinese market. They, uh, they as a market, were much more uh, on the side of the offering that Didi had. So even though Uber generally has product market fit in many of the markets that it's in, uh, China was not a good fit for them. Absolutely. And this going back to one thing that I learned as a growing marketer, there are really three things that you can tap on if you're having an issue in marketing. And the first is improving your target market. So you know where you're going. You really understand who that target is. Second is improving your messaging. We talk about optimization. And third is improving the product. And so if you're having any kind of growth issue, you have to understand, is what I'm saying about this product the right thing? Am I getting the right story across? Mm -hmm. Second, does this product even work? Mm -hmm. Does it have enough differentiation that somebody's going to select your product over something else? And the third is you know, understanding that you're going to the right place and having the right message. So all three of those things come into this play. You talk about having a product market fit. They definitely had a target market, but there was something wrong with either the way they were delivering it or their product wasn't differentiated enough that they could really make headway. Yep. So another thing that sets growth apart is team organization. And I think this is one of the biggest parts of growth is really having a team that has multiple uh, key players that have different uh, core talents. So you're gonna have analytics, experimentation, product design, engineering, product marketing, content marketing, SEO, all of these things are going to work together on a growth team and you might have uh, somebody who is a growth leader or growth lead on that team, bringing everybody together to work towards those same goals. And this is a little different than your typically organized uh, structure because generally you'll have a marketing team, you'll have an analytics team and an engineering team, but here you have maybe one of each of those functions all working together in an agile environment. So that brings us to measurement for growth. How do we actually measure what we're doing here? So as Lewis has mentioned a few times, one of the most important things in growth marketing is the idea of this North Star metric. So the North Star metric is the single metric that best captures the core value that your product delivers to your customers. Optimizing your efforts to grow this metric is key to driving sustainable growth across your full customer base. This is a quote directly from Sean Ellis, uh, the CEO and, and founder of Growth Hackers, also one of the godfathers of growth hacking as a term, that term that we're not going to mention for the rest of this episode. Uh, but I think he's really onto something here. As a team, as a growth-minded organization, we all need to be driving towards a single North Star metric or one of those things that we identify as being the most important thing for our business. So let's look at a few examples. So if we're talking about Facebook, their North Star metric is daily active users. Airbnb is looking at nights booked. Uber is looking at weekly rides. And a really important thing here uh, to keep in mind is that a North Star metric should have value not just for the business, but also for the end user. So as a user, if I'm using Uber, I'm getting value from that uh, business every week as well. If we look at this in the context of the Google Analytics 360 suite, our Google Analytics North Star metric is monthly active users. For Google Optimize, we're looking at monthly active experiments. And for Google Data Studio, we're looking at monthly active users. So overall, monthly actives is our North Star metric across our suite. It varies a little bit uh, depending on the actual product you see here. So when we talk about measurement, we wanna look across the funnel of our product lifecycle or of our customer lifecycle. In the beginning, we talked about that five stage funnel uh, that we looked at when we compared digital marketing and growth marketing. Here, we're gonna look at it in three stages. We're gonna look at it for acquisition, activation, and adoption, which we see as kind of a holistic uh, view across that whole customer lifecycle. So the first stage is acquisition. And here we're gonna look at things like impressions. How are we actually capturing those impressions? What are we doing with them? How are we turning them into new users? And what's our signup rate and our cost per acquisition? So a couple of examples. Uh, we wanna capture those clicks. So we have a lot of different acquisition strategies. Uh, Lewis, you're really familiar with a lot of these. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you wanna talk about some of the things here? 
So absolutely, when it comes to the impression or clicking, you, know, you want to look at the referrals. You know, where are people coming from? What are they doing on your site when they get there? You know, these are the core tenets of analytics. Yep. You know, who are the users? How did they get there? What did they do? And did they achieve the goal that you set out? Now, uh, this is something that we really think about is that delineator between a basic user and advanced user is whether they have goals set up. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you don't have goals set up, you're just watching, right? <laughs> and so we often talk about that as content producers, because all of us are producing content in some way. You have to understand what it is that brings value. Is it cool that somebody visited you from a different country? Sure. Is it cool that you got 100 visitors? Sure. I don't know. Is that enough? <laughs> and so when you look at these impressions and these clicks, you have to understand what does that tell you about these downstream targets that either they're converting or they're not or what type of user are you finding and so your data always tells a story and it's just really a matter of pulling that story out absolutely and one of the really key things when we're talking about capturing that acquisition is of course going to be our campaign tagging so a quick example here you'll see a screenshot on the screen right now of my personal blog, uh, here you can see I've used the source and medium to uh, distinguish which social channel I've posted on, as well as the fact that it was coming from social. And I've used the content field of uh, the UTM string to actually add the title of the blog post that I'm driving traffic to. Now, a really cool thing here is once I started to analyze this data, I actually saw that when I post about Google Tag Manager, I tend to get a lot more traffic coming from Google Plus than from Twitter. But when I post about pretty much anything else, the majority of my traffic comes from Twitter. Digging in a little deeper, I found out or I figured out that there is a large and still very active uh, user community on Google Plus for Google Tag Manager. And so when I would share content there, I would get a lot more action coming from Google Plus. And there's two things on this. One, I'm so happy to see real numbers. You know, so often when we look at people doing screenshots and examples and analytics, they blur it out like it's a big company trade <laughs> secret to know how many visitors they got. They don't want to give it away how big they've gotten or how small they continue to be. So what a I relief to see real to numbers. Know how few people I yeah, have and, and this is this is normal. If you are a blogger, getting a few hundred high qualified visitors is great. It's fine. Uh, it's not something that's gonna be Wall Street Journal numbers or New York Times numbers. This is solid. And the second piece you mentioned about Google Plus communities. One thing we learn as marketers is you go where the people are. Yep. And so for a long time, people have been fighting and pushing you to come just to their website or just to their social network page, whatever they've decided to do. And the reality is you have to listen and your data will tell you where your users are talking about you. And if they have a dedicated community in a place where you're not active, it's your job to go over there and be active or else your competitors will find them yep. and siphon them away. So your data will tell a story that you can take action on. Totally, I 100% agree with that. Go where the users are, base that on the impression and click data and the acquisition data that you have in your analytics account. A few other things that I'm not gonna go into detail here, page tracking, event tracking, form tracking, cross domain, having the right data structures in place. These are all really important. I've blogged about a lot of these. We share a lot of this type of content on the Google Analytics social channels. So definitely dig in more here because these are also very important when it comes to measurement for growth. So the next stage uh, of our key metrics to track is activation. So here we are looking at things like active and inactive users, our retention rate for those users. Um, what is our success rate of actually turning a customer into an active user? And what does it cost to do that? So a couple of quick examples here. Time to first interaction. Now, I think this is a really important metric. And when we're looking at it, let's look at a couple of examples. So Uber, they're looking at your time to the first ride after you sign up. Deliveroo or Postmates or any other food delivery service, they're gonna look at your time to first order. And e-commerce, pretty much any e-commerce site, is gonna look at your time to first purchase. When we put this in the context of AdWords, signing up for an account is really important, but activation actually comes when you've created and run that first campaign. So another quick example for Google Analytics. Acquisition happens when a user signs up for an account, but activation happens when the user actually goes ahead and installs that tracking code and starts using the product. So something that we're thinking about as an organization is how can we make this time period shorter? How can we get people to install that code or work more easily with their developers to get going faster and actually start using the product? So one of the thing that, things that we are experimenting with is activation cues in product. And we're calling these guided flows. 
So you may have seen these in product already. They're little blue boxes that'll pop up for different things. Here we're looking at an example for using custom segments in analysis. So if you've never used a custom segment before, you might see this blue box that talks about using it. And if you click it, it's gonna actually take you into the segment builder and each box you continue to click will take you step by step through how to actually build and use a custom segment. So it's a great little walkthrough or a guided flow of how you can actually get into product and start using some of these features. And we have these for several different features around the product. So hopefully if you haven't seen any of these, you'll see them soon and you can start to learn to use these features step by step. And what I like about this is what you're really doing is walking down that funnel, yep. right? When you talk about time to first interaction, this really can be anything for your business. Often people talk about adding to cart then you have additional metrics if you're an e-commerce store, if you've added to a cart, what percentage of people actually go through and make a purchase? And so what we're not saying is that this first interaction is when you're done. It literally is the first interaction. Mm -hmm. And so you go from having a, a random user who's on the site to them taking an action that proceeds down that funnel uh, toward what you want to have as your North Star. Yep. So the last uh, key metric by LiveStage that we want to evaluate is adoption. So for this, we are looking specifically at adoption rate, but we also need to keep in mind that if users are not adopting, they might be becoming inactive or they might be churning. So those are also things that we will want to pay attention to and potentially send these users all the way back through this life cycle. So a few things that we're looking at here, email nurture campaigns are a great example of nurture and adoption building. So if you sign up for a new account of Google Analytics, on day zero, you are gonna get a sign up email. It's gonna welcome you to analytics. It's gonna have some resources for education and getting started, uh, links to download the GA app, those kind of things. And then every month after that, you will get a monthly performance report. And this is automatically triggered. You can turn it off if you don't want them or you can turn on additional ones for other accounts you have. Uh, but it's gonna be a snapshot of your top account and how it's performing over the previous 30 days. It's gonna give you a lot of different metrics for your site and it's gonna give you some links to actually click go into product and check this out in further detail. So our goal here is to encourage repeat usage, to reduce our customer churn and to provide product value to our users. And some of the things that we are evaluating with this are our open rates, our click-through rates, return or re-engagement rates into the product, as well as our monthly retention rate, which again, if you remember earlier, that's our North Star metric. And these are things that we're using to help drive that. Now, Krista, did you just give away all our company secrets? Sorry. <laughs> so what this is actually doing is showing how Google Analytics measures success. Right? And so often people talk about, why does Google have analytics? You know, we do have a free product. We have lots of users using that free product and we want them to continue doing that. Mm -hmm. But we gain value by helping you have a better success online. And one of the things about these email nurture campaigns is what you were talking is very product centric. You get a day zero message, which says yep. here's what's going on. And you have ongoing updates about your account. But we will also send you messages about what's going on with our product, much like we are today, mm -hmm. and what's going on in the community as we continue to nurture with you, helping with your education to make you better marketers. And we'll do that through our newsletters and through our Twitter account and everywhere else. Yep. Yeah, so email uh, nurture campaigns or just email campaigns in general are a great way to continue with that adoption cycle. So another thing that we wanna look at as marketers and as analysts especially is that full funnel analysis of our customers. We wanna understand and act on the full funnel of the user experience from the first interaction we have with them all the way to a closed lead or a sale uh, and re-engagement. And this is really critical to growth marketing. So one of the things that I wanna highlight here that I think is really cool and actually plays in really well is the new Salesforce Sales Cloud integration that we have with Google Analytics 360. So with this, you can actually send a lead status change from Salesforce to Google Analytics 360 as an event. So for example, when somebody goes from a closed lead to an opportunity to an opportunity closed. Um, and then you can actually use that event data in Google Analytics in any report as you normally would. So here we actually have an example of looking at that event data in a custom funnel in Google Analytics 360. 
uh, and now you can even do this in advanced analysis. Um, but we're looking at online to offline interactions. So we have our online website first interaction data, and then we're following that up with our offline lead status change data. And we can actually see when somebody goes from the first interaction to a closed lead. One of the cool things about this report in particular is those little red arrows that point down. If you click on them, you can actually see and create a segment to remarket or retarget users based on the drop-off. So now with this integration, you can actually remarket and re-engage users who have dropped off in the offline sales process with online re-engagement because of this integration and this data that we have going between these products. So I think that this is a really cool way to drive full funnel analysis and full funnel re-engagement. Yeah, I'm really excited to see this kind of integration with Salesforce. You know, I've been a longtime Salesforce user and we've watched those all the way from having pre-qualified leads through that stage, qualified, developed, shortlisted, all the way up. However your business measures it, it really is critical to understand just what kind of value your marketing team is delivering. And imagine that type of scenario when you're a marketing person going in asking for a purchase order and you go to the CFO and they say, well, what did you get with the 25K I gave you last quarter? And you say, well, actually I gave you $500,000 in real revenue. Mm -hmm. So what they'll probably say is, how do I give you 50,000? <laughs> and I've had this conversation with our CFO in the past is that if you can turn marketing into a profit center, it changes your business. Yep, and this is a great example of how you can start to do that. So the last thing we have here is targeting for re-engagement. This is specifically using Firebase. So we mentioned Firebase earlier, and again, we're gonna be talking exclusively about Firebase in the next episode of Measure Matters. But I just wanted to show one way to use it for re-engagement here. So here we're looking at in-app or push notifications. And we are using our uh, Google Analytics for Firebase data to create uh, audiences and maybe this audience has something like your purchasers, your lifetime value greater than zero, or your high scoring users. And you're going to use that audience to then target them with a free offer for a character in your game in order to incentivize them to come back. So you can kind of imagine the possibilities of what you can do with these audiences from your analytics data in terms of re-engaging users with those push notifications directly uh, targeted to those specific audiences. Things we would want to measure are the message views and interactions, the repeat visits, and the acceptance of those offers. So a really great way to tie in a lot of that mobile app usage too, to re-engagement. So we've talked about a lot, um, but I guess the question that's probably on your mind after hearing a lot of this is, well, aren't we all growth marketers? Uh, we do a lot of the things that you're already talking about. So maybe, but maybe not. I think that the biggest difference between growth, a growth-minded organization and a more traditional product and marketing-driven organization is the willingness to take risks. But it's also North Star metrics, it's full funnel analysis, it's team organization, experimentation mindset, velocity greater than accuracy, and also the idea that risk equals reward. And you mentioned risk. Risk, in my view here, really ties back to experimentation. Mm -hmm. You don't know what's going to happen. Yep. And if you don't know what's going to happen, you had better measure, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're just throwing money away. You're throwing it at the wall. And we used to have this old saying, which was, you know, 50% of my money is wasted. I just don't know which half. And with data from Google Analytics and Salesforce and other tools, you can't say that anymore. And so the world of marketing has changed a lot from having to have your toes in every single campaign just to see what happens mm -hmm. to actually doubling down on those pieces that you know work. And when you talk about growth marketing, and I, I love the fact that we're not talking about growth hacking, is that we are doing this in a smart and developing way. You know, the word hacking obviously has some negative connotations. Um, some people rally around it because it seems raw. It seems like it's just something they can just jump right in. But if you're in a professional organization that has deliverables that make sense for your customers and you have to speak to the C-suite and you have to speak to your investors, then you can't get away with just guessing. Mm -hmm. You have to measure all the way through and there is always risk in a business. Uh, but once you find out what's working, you continue to drive on that and that's where the growth marketers really succeed. Yep. And this actually brings us to the end of Measure Matters episode two. Uh, we're really excited to know that we continue to drive on this. We want to talk directly to you every couple of weeks. We did have a few questions. Uh, one of them, Krista, was very just like, how do I get started in terms of dragging e-commerce into Google Analytics? Like, what are the things that are key for my business that are differentiated from, say, just a flat content site? 
Sure. I mean, one of the most important things that you'll want to measure as an e-commerce business is, of course, going to be that whole checkout flow or that funnel. Um, funnels are a great way to go ahead and measure that. Uh, if you're using the free version of Google Analytics, then I would highly encourage you to have goals set up for your checkout funnel. So having a goal actually on that checkout action and then using uh, the required funnel steps to measure how people are going through that funnel to get all the way through your checkout. So I think that's a great place to start. And we actually had Jason asking us about Google you know, Analytics Academy. This is something that comes up a lot. Uh, that's where you're very active. It's a great way mm -hmm. to talk to our users. So he was asking about the next Google Analytics work for DoubleClick. You know, mm -hmm. When are we going to get DoubleClick in the Academy? Yeah, so actually the Google Analytics 360 course that we just released has a lot of content about DoubleClick and all of the different DoubleClick products. So if you're interested in how to uh, get involved there and really set up those integrations and use that data alongside your Google Analytics data, I'd highly encourage you to check out that course. Now, Paul asked a question, I'll take this one. And he asked, if you're a one person company with limited resources, what's the most cost effective thing to do? Well, the good news is we do have free products. And I really think that is a, a huge differentiator for us is to try and make sure that we can help you measure the activity that happens on your website. We can give you optimized free with up to five reports. Uh, so you can go ahead and make changes to your website and do five experiments. Uh, we can look at Data Studio and have that visualization of how it's all working together. We don't charge for these products because we want you to use them. We want everybody to use them because smarter marketers make smarter internet people. And at Google, we love that. Uh, and so I really want to have you understand that if you're a one person shop and you really have all the rest of your business to worry about, you need to just put in the basic analytics, understand who your users are, where are they coming from? What kind of changes can you make on your site to make sure that they're hitting your KPIs as you drive toward that North Star uh, to bring it all the way through? And Krista, this has been another great half hour plus uh, working with you on Measure Matters. Yep. Um, we are really excited to talk about Firebase and mobile for GA uh, in a couple of weeks. So for all of you who are paying attention, feel free to ping us at hashtag Measure Matters on all of our social networks, and we'll see you next time on Measure Matters. Thanks, guys.